This is Twit. Hi, this is Chibert, Brian Chi, and this is a quiet afternoon special. Well, you know, we've had problems with voice over IP, and a lot of our viewers said they'd like more detail. Well, that's what the after school specials are all about. In segment 2B, we are solving voice over IP and unified communications because they're almost the same thing now, but we're looking at echo problems. Now, we know what echoes sound like, and I'm not, you know, it's when you start saying something and then it comes back at you. So we all know what it, what it sounds like. But Tim Titus, the CTO of Pass Solutions, and I are talking, and, you know, let's go dig into what causes it and maybe some of the history so we can understand the modern causes. So, Tim, why don't we dive in? You know, what sure. co- where did this echo problem come from? And why is it still with us in this digital age? So really what it comes from is the history of our phone system, even though it's it's modern with VoIP and UC, is it all has roots back into the two-wire uh, a POTS phone system, plain old phone system. And there is still a lot of connectivity into that old phone system. There's a lot of uh, capability that's built into phones, VoIP phones and gateways to mimic this two-wire phone system. One of the things that they have mimicked is what's called side tone. So what side tone is, is that when you're talking into a VoIP handset, you hear yourself talk. And what the purpose of side tone is, is it allows you to self-regulate your volume. That way you can talk really quietly and you can hear yourself talk really quietly and know this is how you're going to sound to the person on the far end. If you shout, you know that you're going to hear yourself shouting. Uh, As as an aside, the lack of side tone is what makes it so that people don't know how they sound on their cell phone. If you're on a cell phone call and the other person grows very faint, you start shouting into your cell phone because you can't hear them as well. The silliness is they can hear you just fine you're having problems hearing them. So you're shouting for no reason. So if you had side tone on your cell phone, you could self-regulate your volume. But I haven't found a cell phone yet that has side tone. So side tone is something that you hear locally. An artifact of that local side tone with just two wires uh, of communications going on is you have what's called remote side tone. The remote side tone is yourself hearing yourself from the other side of the call because there's only two wires. There's no separation of of transmit and receive in that sense. It's all on one loop. And you end up hearing yourself at the remote side as well. Now, the reason you don't hear an echo when you have that remote side tone is that it happens instantaneously. So the remote side tone and the local side tone all happen at the same time. You don't detect any echo. On the other hand, If that remote side tone was delayed by, let's say, 2,000 milliseconds or two seconds, what what you'd you'd hear here is is yourself, yourself speaking, speaking in in an, in an echo, echo chamber. So that's where the echo comes from, is when you have the remote side tone have a lot of latency. So you go into your own network and say, okay, do we have latency in this network? And that's really something you're going to want to end up fixing. Okay. Latency. It that's the sounds, source of the problem. It, yeah, it sounds like it's easy to find, but how do we resolve this? You know, okay, let, let's separate this resolution into two pieces. One... If it's just human beings involved, you know, say it's late at night or something, if you're on a two-person call or even a conference call, what kinds of things can users do immediately to try and get past some of this echo problem? So you end up making that call with the other person. And what happens is both of your VoIP phones have what's called echo cancellation circuitry. This echo cancellation circuitry does its best job to try and remove any echo that it sees so that that problem just disappears. The problem is this echo cancellation circuitry works in about 90 to 95% of the cases. If you have high latency, 
then that means that that 5% of the cases where it's just not able to cover that, it's not able to remove the echo, you're going to end up hearing the echo. So in general, if you're on a two-person call, and I think this is something a lot of folks do, hang up and reestablish the call. In many cases, the problem will go away. And you're wondering, well, why did it go away? What changed? Two things changed. Your route path might be different. You might be taking a different path through the network that is more efficient and lower latency. The second problem is you've reset the echo cancellation circuitry and given it an ability to say, okay, try again, catch up, and actually be able to remove the echo. Because honestly, most of these calls, they all have echo. It's a question of whether the echo cancellation circuitry did its job or not. And if you reset it and say, let's try this call again, and the echo disappears, great, wonderful. You're, you're, you're going to be a lot happier at that point because you've reset things. Right. But what about when I've got like 10 people in a conference call? So I think we've all been on that conference call where you've got 10 people in there. Everyone's talking just fine. It's all working beautifully. And that one extra person joins. And as soon as that person joins, echo starts. Now, that one last person is the person causing the echo. So if you're in charge of a conference call, what you want to do is watch the order of people adding to the call. And if you have people just adding, 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 it's going to be difficult to find. But it's the last person who joined the call is adding the echo because their echo cancellation circuitry is not working and it's reflecting everything back into the conversation. That person needs to be dropped from the call. Sometimes muting the person will help fix the problem. Sometimes they actually just have to be removed and then re-added later. And adding them later uh, usually causes their echo cancellation circuitry to be reset, and it's able to catch up and do its job effectively. Okay. Now, let's go look at what happens if, oh, heavens to Betsy, we have echo all the time. Uh, my users are screaming at me. They're pounding on my door. What kinds of things can I do? What, what kinds of tools are available to me to try and track down this problem? So generally for trying to solve an echo problem, what you're going to want to do is, is focus on reducing the latency in your environment. So the first tool you're going to need is you're going to need a call simulator. So being able to simulate synthetic RTP traffic throughout the environment to be able to see what does our latency profile look like from San Francisco to New York? What about San Francisco to Atlanta? Uh, being able to measure that and have baselines and say, we should have no more than 60 milliseconds coast to coast. And if you have spikes of, of latency where it's climbing up to 100 or 200 milliseconds, you need to be able to talk to your carrier about that things you're gonna to wanna to do with them or even with your own network to reduce the latency is optimize your route paths. If you're taking routers that are straight across the country, that's beautiful, you're gonna have low latency. But if your route paths are going around the southern tip of Antarctica, your packets are going bouncing off of a satellite that's halfway to, to the moon, you're gonna end up having some really high latency. So optimizing the route paths to say, how did these packets get from place A to place B and reduce the latency is really what you're gonna to wanna to do. Secondarily, you wanna make sure that your switches and routers aren't adding latency. Uh, I've seen organizations, they have some really nice WAN links, but they've got some uh, 10 and 15 year old network devices. These network devices are routing packets through uh, a centralized CPU. Uh, and that CPU is probably some really old Centrino processor, and it's moving oh, one, one packet across the network. Now it's moving a second packet across the network. Those slow devices are going to add to latency. If you have really old switches that are doing uh, uh, CPU-based switching, routers that are doing CPU-based routing, you want to upgrade those to more modern equipment so that they're only going to be a millisecond or two getting through the network so that you're not creating latency just by your own network equipment. Okay, good advice. But I get latency numbers from ping and traceroute. Why do I, how do I justify going to a call simulator? What makes it different? Am I getting the same kind of information from ping and traceroute? You're getting, I'm going to say, mildly similar. So you can use a, a ping to be able to determine what the latency is to a remote location. The problem is, is that that latency 
is going to be single packet latency. And what you want to be able to do is emulate a phone call to the remote location, which is a stream of packets. And testing a stream and seeing what is happening to that stream is different than what you have when you're doing single packet testing. Um, is it incredibly different? Probably not. Uh, is it different enough that it makes a difference for voice? I would say yes, because single packet latencies might end up showing some really nice numbers. But for a stream, that stream might be slightly different and different enough that it makes a difference for voice. Well, we've talked about all kinds of things. You know, what can we do to solve echo problems? We've talked about a few of the tools. Let's summarize, Tim. What kinds of things, what kind of best practices should we be doing before we go to our boss asking for a copy of Total View? Well, it's it's know your network. Uh, again, I think we talked in the previous one about having a good network diagram, a good map, an understanding of your network, an understanding of your network equipment. What are the models? What are the manufacturers? How old is this equipment? Uh, I think that's the, the, the good first best practice for understanding your network. Uh, and being able to measure what is your latency to that far end of the network. Uh, if you don't have the ability to get uh, a troubleshooting solution like our product, TotalView, uh, then using the occasional ping or set up a continuous ping. Honestly, a continuous ping to a remote location doesn't take much bandwidth. And so if you set that up, you can end up having that go on for days or weeks and be able to say, gee, uh, if we look at that, the results of that ping or trace route over the previous, you know, previous six days, the, the latency uh, on average was about 40 milliseconds. But if you look at it over the past two hours, that latency has been up in the 200 milliseconds. You now know that something has changed. So there are the ability to use free tools to be able to help solve these problems. And latency is one that I think ping would be a, a pretty good replication of it. Just recognize that it's not necessarily exacting enough to really get VoIP. What I mean is, if you have ping that shows ping seems to be good, it might be marginal, but ping's not going to show it. And it's those marginal cases where you have to be careful. Well, we've been talking to Tim Titus of CTO Pass Solutions, and we've been talking about solving echo problems with voice over IP. And of course, unified communications is voice over IP. So we kind of put VoIP slash UC. Well, this has been a quiet after school special. And we're talking VoIP. Next time, we're going and talking about what to do about one-way audio problems in your VoIP system. See you next time.